that we've made our model a little bit more interesting, I want to extend our analysis to include uh, a discussion of cues and resources. But before we get to that, I want to touch on one more minor point. If we go here under the Run tab on the top menu, I want to click on Simulation Setup. There are two particular things we're going to reference here uh, repeatedly. One is the number of runs, the number of times you run your simulation. Now, each of the models we've made so far, we only run them once, but in future settings, we're going to explain why you'd want to run the same model multiple times and then gather results across multiple runs. For, for now, we're just going to stick with one run at a time. But what I want to do now is I want to click on random numbers and I want to click on this box that reads random seed. And I'm going to type a value in there. It doesn't really matter what you type in, just uh, 7 for example. And I'm going to run this simulation with that as a seed value. Now, it's going to generate whatever results it generates here, and in particular, we're going to note the average cycle time through the two different lines. So let's uh, speed this up a little bit. So we've gone through our 30 customers. We have an average cycle time here of 8.68 minutes, an average cycle time down here of 6.14 minutes. Now, if I run this again, because I have planted a seed value Extend is going to generate the exact same set of random numbers every time I run this. So if I just turn off animation to make this run more quickly, you'll notice we end up with the exact same average cycle times, 8.68 here, 6.14 down here. And again, this happens because every time I run this, Extend Sim is using the same set of random numbers. Now why would I want to do that? You want to do that because sometimes when you make a change to a model, you want to know the impact of that change, and it's hard to quantify the impact of that change if you're getting random outcomes. But if you know you're going to be using the same set of activity times, then you know that whatever change you get in your uh, cycle times is due to the change that you've made to the model. Now the change I want to make to this model is I want to introduce the notion of resource pools. So I'm going to use three blocks from, uh, actually two blocks from the item menu. One is the resource pool block, and the other is the resource pool release block. We're going to use a resource, and at some point you have to release it to let it go back to its status quo. So the, I'm adding a resource pool here, and I'm going to give it a name. In this case, we'll call it uh, attending. And I'm going to change the nature of these cues. If you remember when we set these up, we set these cues up as sorted cues using a first in, first out priority rule. I'm going to change that now to make them resource pool cues. And the resource pool they're going to be drawing from is named attending. So what this accomplishes is when an item enters into this queue, it will not leave the queue until it can draw a resource from this pool of resources. In this case, there's only one unit here, but I can make that whatever number of units I like. I'm going to do the same thing here for this queue, turn it into a resource pool pool queue, and have it draw from the same pool. So, for example, I may have two different examination rooms. I may have uh, a resident over here and a resident over there, uh, but nothing can happen until the attending comes in to actually do the process. Now, in order to keep the system from going haywire, we need to release that resource at some point so it can sort of go back to the pool. The way we accomplish that is we're going to insert this resource release block into the flow. So when the job goes through this block, the resource is released so it can go do something else. And we just have to tell it that it's uh, using that same resource pool attending. When it, so when the entity goes through here, it will release one unit back to the resource pool named attending. You have to be a little careful with this because if I said release two units, then what would happen is every time a customer went through here, the number of attendings in the system would go up by one, which is obviously nonsensical. So we've made a change to the system. We've added uh, an attending physician as a resource, which is going to be involved in both of these processes. Let's run this again. And what's going to happen is you're going to be more likely to have customers back up in this system. Why? Because even though you have two different lines, they're both drawing from the same resource. And so what you have is a system that looks like a two-server system, 
but in effect it's going to behave as though it's a one server system because the attendant can only be in one room at a time. This is one reason we do discrete event simulation because sometimes you get systems that look like they're very simple but in reality they can be much more complicated because of the way resources and other things are managed. Now did this make a difference? Well if, if our intuition is correct then we should know that the system should slow down. Why would it slow down? Because again we've gone from a scenario where we have two independent lines to a scenario where these lines are in effect linked together because they're both using the same resource. So on average it has to take you longer to get through that system. And what has happened is the average cycle time here has gone from 8.68 minutes to 9.81 minutes. The average cycle time here has gone from 6.14 minutes up to 7.36 minutes. So what we have done is we have explained wh how this system works this is a little bit more complicated than an MM1Q or a two-server queue, which is the reason we need simulations to handle it. The last thing I want to note before we close out this particular video is I want to go back to the simulation setup menu. And I mentioned the fact that in addition to using random numbers here, or, or seeds for random numbers, uh, in some cases we want to run our simulation multiple times. So let's run this one, say, a thousand times and just just for sort of sake of illustration uh, we'll turn off animation and you'll notice this thing it runs continuously and what will happen is it will run a thousand times you will have different average cycle times for each of those runs so what we will talk about next time is how to gather that data across multiple runs and so you can look at average outcomes even though you're averaging them over a large set of simulation uh, sets of numbers and again the reason you do this is very simple I don't know what the distribution of cycle time is in this model but I do know that the distribution of the average cycle time is going to be normally distributed around the true average regardless of what the underlying distribution is Consequently, I can use simulation and I can simulate a system hundreds or thousands of times. I can look at average values such as average throughput, average waiting times, average cycle times, and so on. And I know that those values are normally distributed. And so by using a large number of simulations, I can create an arbitrarily small confidence interval so that I can state with a high degree of confidence that the average cycle time that I'm pulling across multiple simulations is the is very very close to the average cycle time of the actual system as it will behave in practice and again we'll get to that next time